Throughout this week, we've followed the folly of those elves rescued from Slanesh by Tekla Centurion specifically, and we watched them rise to new heights of achievement and be humbled by petty hubris and self-destruction, only to be born new as the Lumineth Realm Lords. But this is not a standard army, meaning they aren't a, a copy-paste from place to place. The Lumineth Realm Lords from one aspect of the realm will look very different from another because it was Teclas who began instructing them in the way of how they can bond and commune with the realm itself, and that teaching has been interpreted and manifested in different ways. This, to go back to, you know, out of lore for a second, is how we end up with the different sub-factions, right? We call these great nations in the Lumineth Realm Lords. New cities and holds built up from the humbled elves of Hish. Now, I have to say the division of these Lumineth Realm Lords is quite possibly the most clean and cut and dry of each nation, basically acting as its own standalone continent. We'll do a dedicated video on Hish, but looking at the map, we can really see clearly the origins of each nation. The realm is basically cut into eight slices with an island in the center and a jagged ring around, and that makes the ten paradises of Hish. Four of those slices, which represent truly colossal continents, are the children of Tyrion on the left, and four are dedicated to Teclis on the right. They, they help each other, there's not like a border or a wall or anything like that, but it's these four continents of the great nations spawn from. Theirs is a world of perfect symmetry, and their geological features within each landmass really shapes them as a people. So I want to uh, get things they have in common out of the way. When the Lumineth Realm Lords go to war, it's not a typical, you know, military caravan or formation on the battlefield. Everything they do, from their battle stance, the unit formations, like literally the shapes of their formations, etc., is extremely intentional. That by standing in certain formations, they can actually channel um, geomantic power from the earth itself, increasing their effectiveness in battle. As each section of the realm is different, it follows that these formations and disciplines are equally varied. They're tapping into different things. What I'm trying to get at is that if you see a Lumineth Realm Lord, you know, army or something like that coming towards you, there's always more going on than you know. Their formations are actively channeling power. They, they move as a giant siphon of realm power, and they are quickly moving to unleash that power upon you. Again, always more than you know is going on. And there's a lot of talk about symbols in this book and, and how certain warriors or disciplines will bear different runes and symbols of arcane power to strengthen them. But that's a bit hard to articulate in an audio medium, so I encourage you to read that part of the book for yourself. But with that out of the way, let's talk about these great nations of the Lumineth. As we said, they hail from the four major continents of the Teclian Hemisphere of Hish, and those are Emetrica, Syar, Iliatha, and Zeatric. And if I totally butchered those names, forgive my Midwest tongue. Now, there's not a ton of lore on each of these individually, but there's plenty to sink in our teeth into collectively. And so we're going to kick this off with what I think is probably the most iconic of them all, and that is Emetrica. The continent of Emetrica is, is dominated by mountains that pierce high into the heavens. When Teclis came to them with the secrets of reinvention, meaning taught them to bond with the realms and that kind of stuff, they were perhaps the first to adopt this and channel it into communion with the mountains around them, forming the first Alarith. Alarith being Lumineth realm lords that are specifically devoted to studying uh, the mountains, basically. The basic philosophy here is that the higher you climb, literally in a mountain, the easier it is to attain enlightenment. The discipline in climbing, building, and living on a rugged and untamed mountain is the full expression of this place. This nation boasts more Alarith, which I said before is a word denoting that these are realm lords used the mountains and cliff as their elemental force to bind to than any other nation. And as such, their conduct in peace and war represents this. They are stoic and unshakable, very even-tempered. In battle, they form an immovable mountain for foes to crash and shatter upon, just like the mountain forces that they channel inside of them. And we'll explore the elementals and that kind of stuff later, but this force has access to the name character variant here, Avalonor, and they make great use of stone guard warriors as well. But it isn't all high peaks and mountaintops, so to be truly connected to the realm is to be open and learning from all of it. 
And so one of the big trials that these specific realm lords face is descending into the jagged, deep valleys and caves of the land. Because when you become one with the realm, exploring its darkest depths is also an act of self-exploration. You encounter the darkest parts of yourself, and if they were tethered to the wisdom of the Alarith, their spiritual loads, they'd be able to come out alive. If not, they'd lost forever. And I want to point out that their extreme connection with their environment is fascinating, right? Taking on all aspects of the mountain around them to the point where, you know, spelunking is a voyage deep into your own heart. It just seems very intense. It has a real um, as above, so down below vibe where everything is a symmetrical reflection of our world and ourselves. Next up is the great nation of Siar. If the Emetrica are a prime example of the Hish Elves being reborn as Lumineth Realm Lords, then the Elves of Siar exemplify their original fall. This is a nation of artisans and craftsmen, and in the time leading up to the Spire Fall, they were the envy of other nations. Siar craftsmanship is renowned amongst the Lumineth Realm Lords. It's the best of the best, and, and while that quality is appreciated in jewelry and fashion, both of which are they are like the innovators of within the Realm Lords, the real crux of their story hinges upon their weapons. This was one of the nations defined by the outlandishly destructive weapons they created, all while the artisans claimed to never intend to use them. Ancient tomes of arcane, you know, devastation, weapons that could slice reality, uh, shields that were impenetrable, and all of that sounds great, and for a time, it was. They became extremely wealthy and very well respected, but during the Spire Fall, all of that would change, as few would fall from grace harder. Those vaults of unparalleled weaponry were depleted. Weapons beyond understanding were turned on neighbors and family, and the entire continent was kind of torn asunder by war. This is a broken place. The lands are ravaged by arcane weapons, like post-World War II Europe, right? It's just mud and debris and just devastation everywhere. But upon seeing such destruction, no other great nation fell into such despair and remorse. They are a deeply contrite people, and they wanted to change, readily accepting Teclis' teaching when he came back, and they set themselves to the task of reinvention with a lot of vigor. Their artisans and craftsmen decided, okay, no more weapons, we're done with that, and they focused on building things that would benefit others and last eternally. Again, jewelry, art, music, civil engineering on huge scales, they just use their minds for constructive purposes. But there's a problem. The realms were still reeling from the Age of Chaos, and Teclis himself had come down to talk with them, imploring them to go back to weapon crafting at least until the immediate threat is vanquished. Which I imagine had to have been a very awkward talk. I'm just imagining here like, Hey Teclis, we did what you want and found inner peace and, and we turned it into something constructive. And then there's just Teclis on the other side of the table being like, you know, I love it. I love your energy, but also I'm gonna need you to go back to making nukes again. You know, wait, what? Yeah, it turns out this isn't the time to move your budget from military into fashion and road work. We need guns. We need, like, like big guns. And honestly, that's the bulk of their story. And I love this tension. And we see it in a, a lot of media, right? Of, of doing a 180 with your life, heading now in a good direction. But who you were before is needed again, right? These are the John Wick of great nations. Making weapons. Yeah, I guess I'm back. You know, that kind of thing. And... And that inner tension makes them very understandable, makes them very relatable. They want to do good, but to achieve their ultimate goal of getting rid of chaos, they need to do the very things that broke them in the first place. They ultimately submitted to Teclis's will, and now their skill at weapon design and crafting stable ether quartz has made them rise from the ashes. And in game, this is represented by having more ether quartz and some impressive artifacts, things like that. Now next up is the great nation of Elithia. And this one is probably the most wild departure from the others. It gets a bit wiggity. The core philosophy of the Elathians is that if light is not renewed and refreshed, it goes out. You need to keep putting fuel on a fire for it to keep burning. At least that's what they say to themselves and how that forms a society is very interesting. This is a matriarchal society that deeply values having progeny. 
that if we don't teach our lessons to the younger generation and do so in a way that pushes them to excel beyond us, our legacy and all that we've learned will end. So they have a, a big focus on kids and imparting wisdom and, and keeping it going for generations. They want to be the light of reason that never fades. So they have a big emphasis on numbers. So it's not a surprise that this great nation boasts the biggest popular, uh, population that there is, making up a bulk of Lumineth Realm Lord citizenry. Now, having a matriarchal society that values passing wisdom and knowledge to the next generation doesn't make them weird. They stand out a bit as other nations often see, you know, f focusing on family as a distraction from learning, but I can see both sides because attaining wisdom means very little if you die and didn't share any of it because everything you strove for dies with you. But what is weird is how this mentality shaped them before and leading up to the Spirefall. Rather than focusing on magics that were external, like other nations that made these big war machines and incantations, Iliatha focused on the self. Again, how can we maximize the number of people with the most knowledge? The answer is division. The elves studied a specific power that allowed them to basically split themselves. Where there was one elf, now there are two. It's like a crude doppelganger, almost like a magical sprite or familiar, but with its own sentience. They are a different person. True masters of this art were able to split themselves into five or six different pieces, and as you'd imagine, this allowed them to fill their ranks with warriors very quickly. And that division came to a head at the Spirefall, where the magics that kept these doppelgangers around began to crumble, and the very nature of the elves going to war with itself. But I like that you can see their logic, right? Pre and post Spirefall, they want the same thing, it just took on very strange forms before. Nowadays, they still do have the ability to split into twins, but there's a legal limit set by Teclas that there can only ever be two of you. But if two of you are both making families and passing knowledge and wisdom, it excels at the stated goal of multiplying elves who possess wisdom, knowledge, and power. Now, I'll admit, we talked about the rules for these guys a little bit on the live stream, and I'm not sold on their ability to split in twain is really captured by the rules, but I like where their minds are at. After all, the thing that's been drilled into our brains since the first Age of Sigmar publication is that there are very, very few elves. They're hard to find for just about everybody. So having a, a subpopulation of elves, it's like, okay guys, we need to propagate our species, otherwise none of this other stuff really matters, is very interesting. We don't really get that kind of flavor from any other elves we've covered, and focusing on the next generation and, and passing down of wisdom is really cool. It's the very height of hope, because, you know, there will be a world after the ravages of chaos. We can build a future, but we have to make decisions that lead to that future, i.e. having kids and that kind of thing. But in this weird magic of splitting yourself, you can see that very noble idea kind of get twisted because it's sort of sort of like a shortcut to, to beef up the numbers and one that degrades the overall complexity and strength of the elven soul. It's, it's like a halfway measure that they paid for dearly. I also like that there's an infantry focused sub faction. It's easy to get caught up in the crazy stuff like mountain cows and magic and all kind of thing. But at the end of the day, you need bodies. You need a population. And lastly is the great nation of Zaytrik. These are the preeminent spellcasters of the Lumineth Realm Lords. We said earlier in the uh, Metrica section that they were the first to adopt the teachings of Teclas and, and bind themselves to the realms around them. But these elves have taken those same teachings and gone a little bit further. They regularly commune with the celestial bodies in the heavens, often calling Selenar personally rather than going through Teclas. To them, it's better to get information from the source instead of some mouthpiece which irritates the heck out of Teclas, but he hides it well. Only Tyrion knows about this annoyance and it makes him laugh. But really, this is the, the Realm Lord magic-themed faction. It's said that a 10-year-old elf from Zaytrek can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any member of the Collegiate Arcane. And it's not because they are intrinsically magical, but because, as a society, the hunt for knowledge and wisdom is so deeply ingrained that they're just drawn to it. They will go to great lengths to study the magics of other races. They have, you know, uh, ambassadors going to all the different colleges and meeting with the Sylvaneth and the Daughter of Cain to understand their blood magics. Even the faith-based things of like the Greenskins, right, who do all this crazy stuff in the name of Gorka Morka. 
and they have all these scholars trying to find wards to contain the bad moon, but they can't figure it out. The point is, they're very active in understanding the realms around them. While Technus will walk amongst all of his kin as he sees fit, he walks the cities and shores of Zaytrek more than any other, and I think he feels a real kinship with them. Teclis is the mage god, and these children are passionate about spellcrafting just like he is. There are a few little tidbits on, on how they favor iconography of the crescent moon, and, and they try to tap into its power, but realistically, they just love magic, pure and simple. And while there may not be as much, you know, lore, meat on the bone, as it were, I like that there is a magic-focused sub-faction, and I like that it points out one that Teclis likes the most, that he has these favored children, almost. Or at least, followers that are passionate about what he's passionate about. And so, taking a look at these four great nations, why are these cool? Well, I like the fact that they all different, they all kind of focus on different aspects of elven culture, right? They, they all walk down this path of destruction, and they've all risen from the ashes in very distinct ways. You have Emetrica, who's the first to adopt peace tranquility based on their geography with the mountains. You have stuff that's focused on numbers and family with Iliatha. You have ones that are focused on magic and might and ones that are focused on technology and craftsmanship. And, you know, there's just, they're all over the place. And I like how distinct they are, but none of them feel like they just don't belong. They give us some good, you know, flavors for what a Realm Lords faction can be like as well as understanding kind of their relationship to one another, where, you know, now we know that Siar is like this venerated craftsman culture, people will want things and trade with them, and so you can kind of see how they interact with each other a little bit there. If you need, you know, manpower, you'll go to Iliatha, of course. When it comes to healing and, and study and research and education, Zaytrek is the place to go. And so, again, there's a lot of different aspects that you can look into, but you can understand how they sort of work together. This does make me incredibly interested to see the four sub-factions of the Tyrian half of this army, uh, because we don't know anything about it, but I'm curious to see what kind of different parts of elven culture they represent. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these. Which of these great nations is your favorite? I had the hardest time choosing between Siar and Zaytrek. I love the idea of the Siar like, saying, we need to stop making weapons, and then Teclas having to come down and be like, guys, I need you to make some weapons. Like, we just, we need your level of craftsmanship and that pull of like, I don't want to do this thing because it led me to destruction, but also like, how do you say no to techless? So it's an interesting thing. I love that uh, situation. I also like just having a bunch of spellcasters that are really good. I like that backstory. So tell me your thoughts in the comments. I'd love to hear them. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you next time in my next Age of Sigmar lore video. Thank you so much. Happy Wargaming. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed that video. It was made possible by the folks over here to the left. These are my top supporters over here on YouTube and on Patreon that keep this channel going. If you'd like to learn more about how to become a supporter and get some cool things in the process like exclusive pictures and interactions with me and get your questions answers here on the channel, go ahead and click any of the links down below or the join button on the community page over on YouTube. Regardless of your choice, I wanted to thank you so much for joining me with this video and I look forward to seeing you in my next one. Happy Wargaming.